I will start with this slide, which shows all the crises in the world, not all of them, but most of the crises in the world. And every time I show it, I say, the crises are getting worse, and they're getting even more interconnected than they were before. And I think that is really true. What we're interested in is making sure that we think of agriculture, food security, and nutrition security as at the centre of these crises. And it needs to be accorded that position. We don't really quite know where we're going to get to. The, the commitments that are being uh, laid out in Paris mean that we'll probably get to something like three degrees of the three degrees instead of the two that we want to get to. Uh, there's a big move to go to 1.5 and I think that's a, a really good political aim. If you go to we're on track at the moment really to go to that right hand side which will get you to something like 4 degrees and you'll notice there that you've got great areas of very hot climates in northern and southern Africa in particular. Uh, we always have to keep remembering that when something has an average of two degrees above pre-industrial, it's an average. Some places will do much worse. Ag Africa is hotting up faster than any other climate in the planet. Uh, what is particularly interesting is this graph, which I came across recently, which shows when the climates start to move beyond the historical. In other words, when you start to get uh, you start to get weather behaviour that is not in the previous record. Um, a good example is November the 1st near our house in Sussex uh, this month where we hit 22 degrees centigrade. And that's the first time on record that it's been so hot in, in November in, in South East England. And you can see it's mostly it's, you're getting outside the historical in the oceans, but you can see West Africa, for example, are getting it in the next few years, and so on. What we're also getting is more weather extremes. This is um, the great uh, winter of 2010-2011. The whole of the country was covered with ice, and, and uh, most of Ireland too. Uh, that was the year in which there was the great uh, drought in, in uh, America, driest since 1936. It was the great heat wave in Russia. It was the great flooding in Pakistan. And there was more, an, a, another drought in, in Australia. We're going to get more of that kind of phenomenon into the future when all these things start to come together and they will be very difficult to cope with. In the UK, effectively what's going to happen is that it's going to get drier and hotter in the southeast, and the rest of the UK is going to get wetter. In the southeast, it means that we're simply going to go towards uh, producing wine. We've got massive vineyards being planted all over where we live and elsewhere, uh, and that's probably going to be our salvation, it's growing very high quality wines for the rest of the world. In the West, you're getting um, more grassland production and therefore more livestock intensity. And I decided, because I was coming here, I'd try and find out what's going on in Ireland. So I'm going to show you things that you know, but I'll just do it again. If you look at Irish temperatures, it's a kind of mirror in a way. Not a mirror, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a a replica of what's happening in the United Kingdom. You're getting in, in the West here much milder winters into the future. And, and so you're getting earlier springs and that's going to increase your milk production. In the summers it's just going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. Sorry about that, but it is. But the rainfall is particularly interesting because you are going to get more rainfall in the winter. But it's this that's fascinating. is the increasing degree of drought. In, in, it's not just in the southeast of Ireland, I don't know you call that, or the east of Ireland. It, it's over a great deal of Ireland. There. You're, you're getting very 
extensive dry weather into the future. Um, what's going to happen is your the milk yields are sort of leveled a bit, but you're going to go on increasing your milk yield because of the early growth of grass in the, in, in the West. And the potatoes are going to be highly variable, and they're going to suffer enormously from the drought. And uh, the papers I've taken this from, you probably know the person who's written them, um, is arguing that eventually potatoes will not be a crop any longer, in, in a viable crop in Ireland, unless there's considerable irrigation. Which is a, a sort of a rather tragic thing to think about. Uh, wheat and barley are going to go on increasing, but they're going to be replaced a lot by maize and by soybean into the future. I just say that because I've only just discovered it. You probably all know what I've just said, but there it is. But what is important is that both in the UK and Ireland we can cope. The problems are not that great. It'll be easy, relatively easy, to change your cropping patterns. In Africa, it's already tough. You've got much shorter growing periods. Uh, I was in Ghana, in the north of Ghana recently, and the rains came a month late, and they finished a month early, so there was only 100 days. That's happening a lot now. Most important is the maximum temperature above 30 degrees is increasing. And we know what that's doing to maize crops. There's been considerable analysis of maize yields as a function of maximum temperatures. And it turns out that for every degree day above 30 degrees, you lose 1.7% of the final crop. That's a result of 2,000 experiments in Africa. Very well grounded piece of information. So in other words, if you go to 31 degrees, you'll lose 1.7% of the crop. If you go to 32 degrees, you'll lose 3.4% of the crop. If you do that two days successively, it'll be, whatever it is, 7.2% of the crop. Massive loss of maize yield as a result of heat. The point I really want to make here, though, is that agriculture is especially vulnerable to climate change. Crops and livestock are vulnerable to too much water, too little water, too much heat, too little heat. Sort of fundamental vulnerability. Also, farmers are particularly vulnerable. Developing country farmers are small, they don't have much money, they have less than a hectare of land, they have no resources to fall back on. But even developed country farmers, as here, often struggle to make a living, and they depend on subsidies and insurance, and all of them are highly vulnerable to extreme events. So unlike other sectors like, say, aviation or, or house building or transport or whatever else it is, this is a sector that's extremely vulnerable to climate change. That, that has never really been accepted by the negotiators in terms of climate change. There's only a couple of sentences in all the draft negotiations that are going on at the moment which refer to food security or agriculture. And I think many of us think that okay, fine, they'll have this conference but that's not what's important. What is important is after the conference and it's working hard to make sure that the governments, both developed countries and developing countries donors and recipients work to make agriculture much more important in terms of adaptation and mitigation. We know that there's massive hunger in Africa, and that's one of the problems we've got to solve. We also know that it's not an issue of population growth. Everybody, the public all thinks that the real problem is the population is growing and we've got to feed it. That isn't the big problem. It's a sort of problem, but it's not a big problem. The big problem is that we're eating more meat. <coughs> The green there is pig meat, i.e. pork and other products of pigs. 
half of all of that is consumed in China. Half of all the world's pork and pig meat is consumed in China. They've recently bought Smithfield, which is the biggest American producer and processor of pork. The Chinese have bought it. The Chinese import huge amounts of soybean to feed pork and other animals. When we get the next great big confluence of different extreme events, the Chinese are going to go on that market to gab all the soybean they can. It's going to get rough. There's also the problem of land degradation. This is work done in the uh, University of Bonn. All that red area is significant land degradation. These are the hot spots of land degradation. Not just ordinary land degradation, but significant land degradation. In Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's over a quarter of all the land is suffering from severe land degradation. You can see it all along the Sahel, around the Great Lakes and down there. It's massive the amount of land degradation in the world. And we're doing very little about it. It just compounds the issues that we've got. We have to intensify land production. We've got to produce more, given that water and land of good quality is in short supply. And we've got to produce more nutritious food, more variable food, and we've got to produce higher farm incomes. That's what we have to do on the same amount of land or less. I mean, I suppose in theory we could cut down all the forest in the Congo and we could grow a lot more land, but the climate would be even further uh, affected. So we have to produce more with less. But it has to be sustainable. You see, you're adding and adding on the problems and the challenges. You've got to use your inputs more prudently, whether it be fertilizers or pesticides or whatever. You've got to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. You've got to increase natural capital. In other words, you've got to build up soil, soil organic matter. You've got to build up soil moisture. You've got to build up the natural elements of pests. You've got to strengthen resilience. That's what the task is. In some ways, for young people, that's an exciting task. For most of us, it's really horrendous to think that that's what we have to do. At the centre of that is this notion of climate smart agriculture, linked into this notion of sustainable intensification. Climate smart agriculture is uh, contentious. Many NGOs say it's all about industrial hegemony. But the essence of it is that you're talking about adaptation and mitigation, but the mitigation has to be a co-benefit. And I'll come to that in what I'm going to say next. These are the different bits, this was the FAO definition of what climate smart agriculture is about. And I know that you've got a program on this here and uh, it'll be interesting to see how you, uh, how you think about what you're doing in terms of these criteria for what's climate smart agriculture. One approach is precision farming. Sorry, this is a bit, Luke, you're going to have to take out because I don't have the copyright for you. And you put fertiliser in it, and you put that in the hole when you plant the maize plant. You may put some manure in there as well. That way you get away with very, very small amounts of fertiliser per hectare. You're producing higher yields, and you're minimising the amount of nitrous oxide that's being given off by the field. So you're getting all these double benefits, and that's what's exciting about it. And the same, of course, is true of drip irrigation. This is drip irrigation in... Huh. Somewhere. Where was this country? Um, but, of course, you're, you're making sure that you're just using the exact amounts of water for what you want to do. You're not wasting the water. So the principle is the same precision agriculture, even if the practice is very, very different. And the other interest that people have got is in conservation agriculture. Conservation agriculture consists in part, and you've done a lot of work in concern on this, in part on no-till. In other words, you don't plough the land. And because you don't plough it, you conserve its structure rather better. You prevent a degree of erosion. But you can't, don't just not plough the land. You have to keep the land covered throughout the year. 
And you may do that by leaving the stover, the, the material after you've harvested. So, for example, if you harvest the maize, you leave the stalks on the surface of the ground, keeping the ground covered. But you also rotate, and usually you rotate with a, a legume. So those three elements, no-till, uh, keeping cover on the ground, and alternating with a legume. And here you can see an example in, in UK, in Lincolnshire, uh, where the wheat straw has been left on the ground and they're planting a, um, uh, a bean crop in subsequent years. And you're getting increases in yield, reductions in crop establishment, reductions in fuel use, and reductions in erosion of different kinds. It works extremely well. And it's working in many parts of the developing world as well as in the industrialized world. Um, I said there's also the issue of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This is a rather complicated picture, but basically it talks about three gases, Carbon dioxide, which comes from clearing land primarily, methane and nitrous oxide, methane from animals and nitrous oxide from fertilizer. Uh, those are what agriculture gives off. Um, methane and nitrous oxide are much more powerful in terms of creating global warming than carbon dioxide. So agriculture as a whole is a major contributor of greenhouse gases in the world. Something like 14% of all the greenhouse gases come from agriculture as such, with another, what's it, 15 more percent coming from clearing land. It's a big contributor. How you reduce methane and nitrous oxide, there's various attempts being made with genetics and better management and different livestock and so on. There are good examples working at a small scale, but there's very little working at any kind of large scale. And we need much more effort to go into this in terms of producing large-scale solutions. In most cases, what we need is a combination of adaptation and mitigation. In other words, mitigation needs to be the co-benefit, or the afterthought, or the extra that comes out of it. There's a, a well-known crop which... Um, RSA has been promoting. These trees are called phytherbia. They're a kind of albizia. They have the curious habit of shedding their leaves in the wet season. And when they shed their leaves, you get more nitrogen because they're leguminous. And there's enough nitrogen underneath these trees to produce you three tons of hectare without three tons of maize per hectare, without adding fertiliser. And they put carbon back. They'll put carbon back to... Oh, it's underneath, sorry. Uh, two to four tons per hectare you can get from under this kind of agroforestry. It's much better than conservation farming, in fact. And you've got the standing crop, when it's mature, will give you 10 to 20 tons of carbon in the land. We need more examples like this, of where you do something that actually increases your yield, but at the same time gets carbon back into the soil or reduces methane or nitrous oxide. The problem is of financing. If you're a farmer and your extension agent comes to you and says, oh, we think you should do this or we think you should do that, and you know, after three or four years you'll be much better off as a result, the farmer will say, yes, 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 and say, I don't have the money, I don't have the time, I don't have the labour to do what you want me to do. It's very difficult to get farmers to invest in their land, particularly if they're small, with less than two hectares of land. There are all these climate funds, about 50 different climate funds in the world. Um, we can recite them. There's the Green Climate Fund, the Climate Investment Fund, the Green Te Clean Technology Fund, the Green <coughs> Development Mechanism, and so on. Lots of them there. But 
They're nearly all very complex, they're very bureaucratic, and they're very difficult to access. So virtually none of the funding goes to Africa. And none goes to smallholder farmers, or minute amount goes to smallholder farmers in Africa. And that has got to change. Nothing will happen until that really changes. That's the depressing thing that's out there. You'll hear a great deal about all these pledges of money for climate change, but it's not getting to Africa and it's not getting to smallholder farmers. Uh, value chains are important as part of this mix. You can think of the value chain running up to from rural to urban. There's all kinds of issues you can hang on value chains. The one that I just want to mention very briefly is insurance. Farmers will only be innovative if there is some degree of insurance. They're only likely to buy new seeds or fertilizers or to invest in their land if there is some kind of insurance that protects them when it all goes wrong. And I've had a, a brilliant PhD student called Eric Chavez who has developed a mathematical construct that gives you the probability of extreme weather over one or two decades for a particular area. And he was finishing his PhD and Sainsbury's heard about his PhD and they asked him to go and talk to them. And as a result of that, he's raised the one and a half million euros for this insurance program. In the UK, six billion pounds a year are lost because suppliers don't supply what they're contracted to supply to supermarkets. The bill for Sainsbury's was 600 million alone. And what he's done is to produce this, this uh, scheme, and it's down to eight uh, kilometer uh, air pixels, if you like, which gives you the, the kind of weather and so on into the future. And we've got a pilot program in Tanzania on this to see how well this will work. The whole notion is to give farmers much more confidence that when they do things that they haven't done before, they will get uh, some insurance in the programme. Finally, resilience. Resilience is about how you react to stress or shock. You can anticipate it, you can survey it, you can prevent it, tolerate, recover it. The trouble is we tend to spend <coughs> all our money down here recovering and restoring, not in terms of preventing what will happen. How do you get resilient livelihoods? Good example in uh, the, the mouth of the Sundarbans in India. This woman grows rice and she also grows vegetables. She's got a husband and he raises fish fry. He's got a little bicycle a taxi which he rides around the village and you can have a ride on it or you'll take your bags with him. So they've got the rice, they've got the vegetables, they've got this. And as I was walking away, there was a, a solar panel on the, on the thatched roof. And most, most of you who've worked in Africa know that if you go to a village, what you have to do is ask a lot of daft questions and then you finally find out the truth. So I said, oh, why have you got a solar panel? Electricity. He didn't say electricity dummy, but he said electricity. <laughs> and I said, oh, why do you want electricity? He said, for light bulbs. He said, you know, he's going to be pretty cross at this point. And then I said, why do you want light bulbs? And then he said, so the children do their homework. So his children do their homework. They will get some kind of qualification out of their school. They will go and get a job in the nearby little township. And then there'll be another source of income for that family when the next cyclone comes, and it did come not very long after I took those photographs. And I think there's a general lesson there. It's not just Sundarbans in India. It's for all of us. But that's one of the answers we have to take. Thank you.